Hello everyone, Mr. Lipchick here, and our topic for this segment of instruction is the labor market. The labor force. The labor force is defined as all non-military people who are employed or unemployed. <coughs> the Bureau of Labor Statistics, or BLS, tracks information about the labor force. The main factor tracked by the BLS is the unemployment rate. The BLS answers two questions. One, how many people are in the labor force? And two, how many people are employed? If you are 16 years old or older, have not worked for pay in the last week for reasons other than vacations or strikes, and are seeking work, you are considered unemployed. Stay-at-home parents, full-time students are not considered unemployed. The labor market changes along with the economy as different skills and numbers of workers are needed. Our economy has moved through many different phases. Our nation's early economy was primarily agricultural until the middle of the 1800s. Now that's when the McCormick Reaper and other inventions resulted in the mechanization of agriculture, freeing up people to work in an industrial capacity. The development of interchangeable parts and dramatic technical discoveries in power and steel making fueled the Industrial Revolution in the United States which was pretty much between the middle of the 1800s into the early 1900s. Automobiles, steel, electricity, and other industries accelerated the Industrial Revolution. So fewer farmers were needed and more factory workers, resulting in a different labor market. With interchangeable parts, you were able to have mass assembly lines where each worker assembled a different part or made a different part, uh, which made uh, the production much faster, and much more consistent. An electronics boom took place in the mid-20th century and added even more industrial jobs to the economy to produce radios and other electronics. Industrial jobs, however, began to decline in the early 1960s with increasing competition from foreign products entering the they market. Eventually, manufacturing declined to a very low level by the 1980s, creating an industrial rust belt of old plants in the northeastern United States. Our economy, however, has begun to recover through the service sector and through high technology. Our high-tech industries have created what have been called the what has been called the information age. The development of solid-state components and electronics has contributed to the growth of the computer industry. Changes in the labor force. Until the 1950s, only 50% of Americans finished high school as manufacturing jobs were plentiful. Today's jobs require skills and education and have changed the labor force. There's something called the learning effect, and this is the theory that education increases productivity and results in higher wages. And there is also the screening effect, and this is the theory that the completion of college indicates to employers that an applicant is intelligent and hard working. So while a college degree is not a guarantee of a good job, it increases your chances significantly. Since the early 1960s, there have been uh, growing numbers of women entering the workforce. The women's liberation movement encouraged them to acquire more education and break occupational boundaries. A growth in white-collar jobs that required more brains over brawn increased opportunities for them. Another change is an increasing number of temporary workers or temps over permanent employees. 
contingent employment or part-time work has become common. Employers can pay them less, withhold benefits, and lay them off to save money. Wages and benefits. Wages and benefits have generally declined due to the loss of manufacturing and high numbers of people seeking jobs. Wages for unskilled workers have declined. Wages for educated workers have increased. And there is the law of supply and demand. Supply and demand applies to labor as well as other things. Demand for labor is what is called a derived demand. Derived demand is demand that is determined by demand for another good or a service. Example, demand for lawn services determines the demand for landscapers. The productivity or value of output for individuals who do this work will determine their wages. Labor is subject to supply and demand levels like all other factors of production. High supply of a particular skill set will lead to lower wages. Eventually the market will arrive at an equilibrium wage where there is no excess, or su excess supply or demand for that type of work. Jobs are classified according to skill level and education. Unskilled labor requires no specialized skill, education, or training. For example, custodial work, dishwashing. Semi-skilled labor requires minimal specialized skills and education, such as data entry, heavy equipment operator, and short or cook. Skilled labor requires specialized abilities and training to do tasks, such as operating comp complicated equipment, this includes plumbers, electricians, and carpenters. And there's professional labor, which demands advanced skills and education for jobs such as nursing, medicine, education, accounting, and many others. The equilibrium wage, <coughs> wage for professional and skilled workers will be higher because of a shorter supply and higher demand for these workers. There's also wage discrimination. The Equal Pay Act of 1963 and Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 make it illegal to discriminate in pay offered to employees on the basis of race, sex, color, religion, or nationality. Although there has been progress in this direction, women and minorities still receive lower pay, on average, than white males. Women, on average, only make 80% of the salaries that men get for doing the same work. Many minorities earn less because of a deficit in education and experience levels. Other factors affecting wages? Safety regulations, long needed to protect workers from serious injuries, create additional expenses that reduce the number of jobs. The minimum wage created in 1938 keeps wages at a minimum level for all employees, but keeps employment below its equilibrium levels. Labor unions representing large groups of employees drive wages above the equilibrium wage, resulting in a lower demand for employees. That concludes our discussion on the labor market. Thank you for viewing, and I look forward to seeing you in the live lessons. Have a great day.